A group of 10 that doubles every 18 months will reach a thousand people for God in 10 years. And I want to invite you to join me in embracing the vision of a group doubling every two years or less. And to explore today's topic, I want to do a little Bible study together. I want to look at a, at a Bible verse and ask you a question about it. The Bible verses Acts, Acts 14, 1. And we want to look at why did these people, how is it that these people came to believe? At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Why? Why did a great number of Jews and Greeks believe? Well, if you're a Calvinist, you might say they believed but because before the foundation of the world, God predestined and rendered certain their conversion. And if you're an Arminian, you might say they believed because they chose to believe by their free will. But I want, what I want you to see in this passage is that this passage actually doesn't say either one of those things. This passage says something different. It says that they spoke so effectively that in order that, so that, a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. In other words, the number of people who believed was tied to the effectiveness, not just the content, but the effectiveness of the teaching. And I've heard many people say over the years, preachers say, well, you know, I'm not much of a preacher, but you know, let's just God, may God bless the reading of your word. And the truth is you don't have to be, we're going to get into this in just a second, but you don't have to be Chuck Swindoll to grow a Sunday school class, to double a small group. But the teaching does have to be, as I like to say it, at least halfway decent each and every week, nothing less will do. This is the first of five principles we want to look at over the next five weeks of how to double a group every two years or less. And the first one is this. We want to teach a halfway decent lesson each and every week. Nothing less will do. Then we want to invite every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month. We want to use fellowships as a bridge for the gospel to share. We want to use relationships as a bridge for the gospel. We want to give Friday nights to Jesus. We want to encourage the whole group toward ministry. And lastly, we want to reproduce our group. But let's talk about this first one. Teach a halfway decent lesson. Halfway decent decent lesson each and every week, nothing less will do. And the big idea is you don't have to be Chuck Swindoll to double a Sunday school class, to double a small group. And it's what the Bible says. The Bible says we have this treasure, the treasure of the gospel of God. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Howard Hendricks paraphrased it by saying, God has taken the mystery of the gospel and have poured it into common, ordinary, peanut butter jars. I write Bible study lessons for a living, and I do so in order to let the common, ordinary, unschooled layman to lead a small group. I like to say, if you can read 20 questions, you can lead a small group. Acts 4.13 says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized these are just unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And to illustrate this point, I like to illustrate th this way. Who is the number one seller of hamburgers worldwide? Who is the number one seller of hamburgers worldwide? And the correct answer is McDonald's. And I'd like for us to do a little market research on behalf of McDonald's. And I've done this many times, so I know how it's going gonna to co come out. And I want you to think about rating McDonald's best hamburger on a scale of 1 to 10. All right, so if it's a really fine hamburger, you'd say, well, we'll give it a 10. If it's a really crummy hamburger, we'll give it a 1. But how would you rate McDonald's best hamburger on a scale of 1 to 10? Now, your number may, may vary widely from this because as I've done this many, many times before groups, the numbers, individual numbers, will vary widely. I remember one place in Missouri I was at, and two, a man and wife both proudly raised their hand like this and gave, gave me two 10s, and my host told me afterwards that they actually own three or four McDonald's stores. But uh, that's kind of the exception, uh, get a lot of ones, get a lot of fives, get a lot of se sevens, and, and so on. How would you rate McDonald's best hamburger? And as I've done this in in place after place after place, I've discovered that the averages come in about five. Well, it, it raises the question then, how did they do that? How did they become the number one provider of hamburgers worldwide? And uh, if we were in a small group, which I wish we were, uh, we, we would brainstorm about this and you'd come up with some answers like location, like marketing, like consistency and, 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 and so on. But the idea is they take a halfway decent burger. It doesn't have to be a fantastic burger. 
It just has to be a decent burger and they surround it with some other things. And in weeks to come, we're going to talk about what those other things are. We're going to talk about inviting every member and every prospect to every fellowship uh, every month and giving Friday nights to Jesus and getting the whole group involved in, in, in doing these things. And you as teacher cultivating laziness, as we will talk about in, in, a, in a few weeks. But the point is we take a halfway decent presentation of the word of God and we surround it with some of the other things and we can double a class every two years or less. And a group that doubles every 18 months will reach a thousand people and in 10 years and my heart hungers and I hope you've been praying about and thinking about and longing for and reading about a doubling group movement. The reason we do this video, and especially in Sunday school world, I want to speak to both small group, home group, group leaders, as well as adult Sunday school teachers. But truth be told, most of my work has been with adult Sunday school teachers. And in Sunday school world, I have visited class after class after class over the years. And I will tell you that in some cases, in some cases, our teaching is nowhere close to halfway de decent. Bruce Wilkinson says he hears it. 80% of the time, Sunday school is boring. There is a reason why Sunday school is not growing, and it's not because we can't figure out how to do evangelism. It's because in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, this, the teaching itself is boring. Now, I don't know how exactly Bruce Wilkinson came up with his research. It sounds a little bit negative to me in, in, in my experience. I've done some of my own reach, research, and I've discovered that the number is about one in three. In other words, if we were, if I were teaching this in a group, I would say it this way, turn to the person on your left and turn to the person on your right and imagine this, one of those two people is boring. One out of three teachers are boring. It is a huge problem. I remember being in a class one time and the teacher was teaching from the King James Version and he read the text in John 17 where it speaks of Judas, son of perdition. And he looked at the group and he said, now, predestination, who really understands predestination? I'm looking at my King James Bible there and I'm thinking to myself, that word is not predestination. That word is perdition. I looked it up later and discovered these words are more or less opposite. And I, I thought about that class later and I thought about, you know what? If this guy had read one commentary, a quarterly, a teacher's book or a student book, did a Google search of any kind, he would have sorted out the fact that this word is not predestination. It is perdition. Judas, son of perdition. But here is my guess. And it is only a guess, but here is my guess. My guess is he was looking at that text for the very first time that morning and winging it. And I'm telling you, I've been in class after class after class that I found myself shaking my head. I went to that church to talk to them how, about how they could double their class in two, classes in two years or less. And I went to a Sunday school class and I walked out and sh shook my head and said, not that kind of class. You're not going to get there with that team. You can't get there with that kind of teaching. The teaching does not have to be fantastic. The teaching does not have to be amazing. It has to be better than that. It has to be at least halfway decent. And in some cases, our teaching is nowhere close to halfway decent. So let me talk, talk to you about four ways you can ensure that your teaching is at least halfway decent. And the first one is this, ask lots of questions. Ask lots of questions. Questions are inherently more interesting than lectures. It is more interesting to participate in a discussion than it is to listen to a lecture. Secondly, questions lead people to speak the truth and be changed by the truth. I've got some whole videos and books and whatnot that, that deal with this topic, but let's, let me remind you of Ephesians 4.15 that says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. Now, I would have expected that verse to say, hearing the truth, we will grow. If we listen, if you sit still while I instill, if you sit still while I speak, then you will grow. But that's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible says, speaking the truth, we will grow. We are changed more by what we say than what we hear. James talked about the fact that the tongue, the words you say, is like a rudder. I think if he was right today, he might, might say it's like a steering wheel. That if you speak words of gratitude, you become more grateful. If you speak words of love, you become more loving. If you speak words of criticism, you become more grumpy. You become what you speak about. Instead, speaking the truth, we will grow. And that's why we want to encourage teachers to teach in a question and answer format. We have a hundred examples of Jesus and asking questions in his teaching. And we want to follow the example of, of Jesus. 
And the, and the third benefit of a question and answer approach is that it makes it easier to find workers. What is the bottleneck? We'll talk about this in weeks to come, but what is the bottleneck of the disciple-making evangelistic process? Why isn't the church growing and thriving as we would long for it to do? Well, Jesus actually addressed this topic. He said the harvest is plentiful. He said the problem is not with the harvest. The problem is not with lost people. What is the problem? Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. The Remember what that, what that next word is? The, the workers, the workers are few. And I found it is far easier to find workers if your groups are using a question and answer format. If you are look, using a lecture format, the people in your group will see you lecture. And even if you do a good job, which I want to argue there's a good chance you might not be, but even if you do a good job, there's a, the people in your group will say to themselves, I can never do that. But if you ask a question and talk about it a little bit and ask a question and talk about it a little bit and ask a question and talk about it a little bit, it becomes far easier to reproduce your group. We want to ask lots of questions. Secondly, we want to tell lots of stories. This is what Jesus did. I love this paraphrase. All Jesus did that day was tell stories. A long storytelling afternoon. The CEV translates this way. Jesus used stories when he spoke to the people. In fact, he did not tell them anything without using stories. Do you, teacher? Do you ever teach a lesson without finding a good story to illustrate your point? Jesus didn't. Jesus never taught anything without telling a story. There's been research on this in recent years, and, and what we've discovered is that the mind, the brain, is wired for story. It's wired for story. And you would do well when you teach, teacher, to ask lots of questions, and secondly, to tell lots of stories. I try to find those stories on Tuesday. On Monday, I try to figure out what is the one big idea, what is the single big idea I want to try to communicate. And on Tuesday, I try to find a story, maybe a video, story, but sometimes a story I would just read. Sometimes a story I would just par paraphrase. Sometimes more than one story. But on Tuesday, I'm looking for some good stories that will make this point come home. It's one of the things I try to include in my lessons. Good questions have groups talking, and I provide answers to those questions and many of those answers in the form of stories. Third thing we can do to make sure that our teaching is at least halfway decent is to try to reduce that teaching, reduce that big idea to a proverb. Let me show you one verse translated five different ways. The CEV in John 10, 6, we read, Jesus told the people this story. In God's word, Jesus used this illustration. In the ESV, this figure of speech. In the TEV, he told them this parable, which I think is not a particularly good translation because there actually is another Greek word for parable, and it's not the one that's being used here, and you might think it is because they translate it parable. In the message, the paraphrase, Jesus told this simple story, but they had no idea what he was talking about. In Logos Bible software, software, we can do what I call a vertical word study where we go down vertically into the Greek and look at the Greek word and we can see how it's translated in various cases. In one case, it's translated proverb. And we can find this verse in 2 Peter 2.22. Of them the proverb are true, a dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to wallowing in, in, in her mud. And the idea is that Jesus often taught this way. Jesus often taught using proverby, pithy sayings. And if you can, teacher, reduce your teaching, reduce that big idea into a proverb kind of saying, uh, it's going to help you teach like Jesus and help you to be an effective teacher and help you to teach at least a halfway decent lesson each and every week. Nothing less will do. So we want to, number one, you remember what it was? We want to ask questions, tell stories, reduce it to a proverb. And fourthly, I want to say, we want to tell them something they had never heard before. Matthew 13, 52 says, He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. We're telling the old, old story. I remember hearing a preacher say back, back in the day, if it is new, it is not for you. If it is new, it is not for you. And in some sense, we don't want to get too creative in, in our teaching. But on the other hand, our teaching needs to have a certain freshness about it. Two of the most powerful words that you can say in your teaching are this week. 
This week, I was reading in my quiet time. This week, I was studying scripture and observed something that I have never seen before. This week, I was meditating in prayer on this passage. This week, I was watching the news and thought about how this Bible passage relates to our life situation. Bruce Wilkinson tells the story of one of his teachers in seminary, and he was one of his best teachers in seminary. And oftentimes, early in the morning, Bruce Wilkinson would, Bruce Wilkinson would ride his bicycle to school, and he would ride, ride right by this professor's house and early in the morning before sunrise he would see this professor pouring over the books he'd be at his desk and he'd have these stacks of books and he would be be studying and then oftentimes uh, bruce wilkinson would stay at, at seminary late into the evening and the sun, sun had set and he'd ride his bicycle home again by that professor's house and again he would see that professor pouring over the books again and this particular professor taught something like New Testament survey. That is a very basic biblical course. And so he asked his professor one time, why do you keep studying? You've been doing this for 50 years. Surely you know this content by now. Why do you keep reading and thinking and pondering and praying over this content? And the teacher said something that ought to be the mantra of every Bible teacher. And that is this. He said, I want people to drink. I want people to drink from a living stream. And teacher, if you want your teaching to be at least halfway decent each and every week, you want people to drink from a living stream. You want them to sense that you have been with Jesus this week, that you have been in the presence of God this week, that each day you have started your day with your Bible on your lap. And some days you would start even maybe before you even teach your lesson per se. You would say, let me read to you a passage that I read on Tuesday that particularly uh, got, got, got my at attention. And you would teach out of the overflow of your heart. And if we're going to start a doubling group movement, we need an army of teachers. We need an army of teachers who will teach out of the overflow of their life.